This video is brought to you by NCIX.com. Great technology, selection, and service. AMD's R9 Nano officially launched on August 27th, where we saw the initial slide deck with the specs, the card design, and our, at the time, speculation of how the Nano will perform against competing cards. And all of that can be found in our R9 Nano Explained video, linked in the description or in the eye here. I'm Dimitri with Hardware Canucks, and the R9 Nano officially launched today for retail. We have all the gaming performance, all the acoustics, power consumption, frequencies, uh, and everything will be ready for you in this video. Make sure to stick around. This is going to be a good one. Now to quickly recap what the Nano is trying to achieve is become the ultimate 4K compact ITX GPU for the living room. Simply because it's so tiny at 6 inches or 15 centimeters with a great cooling solution yet feature a fully enabled Fiji XT core. The same that is found on the Fury X with 4 gigabytes of HPM. But with a 100 watt TDP reduction than the flagship. And this is done through picking only the most efficient cores and thus introduce a challenge in its own for availability and overclocking that we'll talk a bit later. Priced at $649, the R9 Nano is a niche card for several reasons. First, you can look at what competing cards you can get for the same amount of money, like the really appealing Fury X or the 980 Ti. Second, if you're really after the ITX form factor, most newly released small form factor enclosures support 10.5 inch GPUs that could void the compact appeal of the Nano. Take the SG13 from Silverstone, for example. This is a perfect ITX chassis for the Nano that leaves plenty of space inside for a front-mounted radiator, as the car does not even extend past the motherboard itself. And you could say that this case is actually too big for the Nano. On the flip side of that coin, the SG13 has no issues accommodating for a 980 or a 980 Ti. Thus, I suspect that most potential owners of the Nano will pick a really narrow case on purpose to accommodate for that short form factor as put the nano inside a full tower and an ATX motherboard and to me this looks completely out of place and while looks aren't really everything the R9 nano is an ITX card designed for ITX habitat only in my opinion but be aware of the fact that aside from triple display port 1.2 the HDMI port is only 1.4 which makes 4k gaming in the living room not as appealing at 30 Hertz as most UHD TVs still are not equipped with display port. Now for the price, I was expecting AMD to focus a bit more on the shroud design, especially considering how much thought and emphasis went into the uh, cooler design for the Fury X. So the Radeon text on both sides is not illuminated, it's just vibrant red and gets kind of lost in the dark. Plus we have no backplate, leaving the dark PCB exposed, which I think is on purpose as most ITX cases will have the GPU standing like so, and the backplate you could say is not really necessary. It is impressive though at what AMD can achieve with such a tiny yet effective cooler and a single 90mm fan, keeping the card during load at 74 degrees Celsius, which is a fantastic temperature for tight enclosures. Although the VRMs, check out these uh, thermal shots here, get super hot and we advise to set up the best possible airflow to get rid of all that heat away from the PCB. Now there's a constant balancing act with monitoring core frequencies to hit the power and temperature targets with a nano hovering around 900 megahertz, which was our exact expectation. Having said that, our sample experienced some terrible coil whine, bumping the nano into being one of the loudest cards in our stack. This is not the fans fault per se, as it is library quiet as AMD calls it, but the coil whine is definitely part of the equation. Take a listen. To power the Nano, you'd need a single 8-pin that plugs into the back and thus extends the length of the GPU by at least an inch, keep that in mind. 
However, check out that power consumption. The R9 Nano turns out to be an incredibly efficient GPU when compared against the Fury X. We are happy to see this and the binning process seems to have made a significant impact on separating the Nano against all other GPUs. And with that out of the way, let's check out the benchmarks. Now obviously from a pure raw performance perspective, the R9 Nano isn't at the top of the charts, but given it's placed in a completely different category for ITX, the Nano is a powerhouse of its own, beating the 980 and the 390X easy. As for overclocking headroom, we were not expecting much from the Nano and were pleasantly surprised when the core pushed all the way to 1070MHz stable, bringing the performance right below the Fury X. So where does this leave us with the Nano? It's obviously not a perfect GPU, with two major downsides being acoustics and the lack of HDMI 2.0, whereas power efficiency, stable core frequencies and form factor are all major selling points. And for prospective buyers, it really becomes a balancing act whether or not you value the ITX length of the card over loud operation and whether or not your priorities lie with the size uh, and not within choosing to go similarly priced but outperforming solution. But having said that, this is an absolute step in the right direction and we're giving it the Hardware Knox Damn Innovative Award. And so now that you've seen all the numbers, would you recommend the R9 Nano to a friend who is potentially building an ITX system for the living room? And if not, how would you set up the perfect ITX gaming machine? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe for more similar content and we'll see you in the next one.